Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have another busy week of spaceflight news to cover from the Warp 9 pace at Starbase as we saw the rollout of the first version 2 Starship and a static fire test of the Flight 6 Super Heavy already. SpaceX launched 45 Starlink satellites across two launches, one of which was the 100th Falcon launch of 2024 as well as 21 Starshield satellites. China conducted two Long March launches, Blue Origin premiered both a brand new booster and a brand new crew capsule on their NS-27 mission, SpaceX Crew-8 returned to Earth after the longest ever Crew Dragon mission, and more troubles for Boeing after a satellite they built broke up in space, and their losses on the Starliner program increased by over $250 million. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. Starbase is showing no signs of slowing down despite the monumental moment of Mechazilla's catch of Flight 5 Super Heavy 12 booster, which was since moved back to the build area of Starbase for presumed detailed inspection of both it and its 33 Raptor engines. While the booster held up remarkably well, there was some damage to part of one of its chines and there was some clear warping of multiple engine bells. However, it looks like SpaceX have finished their inspections, for now at least, as the booster has now departed the production site, making an overnight journey to the rocket garden. Will it be preserved or will it be scrapped? The pessimist in me says it'll probably be scrapped. Real estate is competitive at Starbase and not even SN15 was spared the chopping block. There is some hope that SpaceX might try and preserve the first recovered Super Heavy though. The first ever recovered Falcon 9 first stage remains on display outside SpaceX's Hawthorne facility, so who knows? Will it be scrapped or will it be saved? Cast your votes in the comments below. Last week also saw the recovery of Booster 12's hot stage ring, which was jettisoned shortly after stage separation. NASA Spaceflight captured the Ridgewind salvage ship lifting the ring from the Gulf, so if SpaceX do choose to display Booster 12, they might be able to mate it with its staging ring again. Regardless of their plans for Booster 12, SpaceX have wasted no time pressing ahead with Flight 6. Lucky Super Heavy 13 departed the build area and made its way down to the launch pad last week to begin engine and chopstick testing just two weeks after Flight 5. Its stint at the pad began with installment into the orbital launch ring, and test commenced with some cryo-loading into its fuel tanks. This was a great indication that the pad only suffered minimal, if any, damage during Flight 5. Now, this wasn't the first ever cryo-test for Booster 13. Here's some footage from Lav Padre of it undergoing cryo-testing at Massey's back in April this year. This meant that last week's tests were hopefully going to involve a little bit more, namely a static fire of its Raptor engines. And towards the end of the week, that's what we got. We we saw ice forming up the sides of the vehicle, indicating fuel loading, before activation of the fire suppression systems, water deluge, and then the main event itself. Once again, demonstrating insane progress cadence with these vehicles. While Flight 6 could happen very, very soon, there's probably going to be a longer wait between Flight 6 and Flight 7, because Flight 7 will likely be the first to feature version 2 of Starship, which so far hasn't undergone any testing. Until now, that is. Yep, we finally saw Ship 33, the first V2 Starship, in all its glory. It was rolled out of Mega Bay 2 on the ship cryotesting stand and was sent off to Massey's to begin its cryotesting campaign. Version 2 Starship's most obvious change from version 1 is its smaller and more leeward forward flaps, which will hopefully be more resilient to the heat of re-entry. Currently, Ship 33 doesn't have any engines, so right now we're all quite curious about whether it will sport Raptor 2 or Raptor 3. So far, Raptor 3 has only ever been seen in the engine test stand. It's never been fitted to a vehicle before. We're not really sure how flight ready Raptor 3 is either, so it might be a while before the engines are ready for ship installation. SpaceX won't need 39 Raptor 3s though, only 6, as so far there's no version 2 booster, so there will be a period of time where the version 2 ships will be launched on the version 2 boosters, which of course are powered by Raptor 2. All in all, this is a very interesting area of Starship development to watch. One thing we expect to see during Flight 6 is another catch attempt of Super Heavy. In similar fashion to Booster 12, Booster 13 was raised by the catch arms to the top of the tower, the same height the arms are when the catch is made. I'm curious about the benefits to doing this test again with an empty booster. Surely there's not much new to learn from doing this again? I'm very open to hearing your ideas behind this in the comments below. 
I want to talk about a Starlink mission that didn't actually take place last week, but on the 19th of October. This carried 20 Starlink satellites to orbit from Florida, including 13 with direct-to-cell capabilities, or in other words, ones that can connect directly to cell phones without the need for dedicated ground receivers. The reason I bring this launch up, after already covering it in last week's episode of Space This Week, is because SpaceX recently shared new footage from the fairings during separation, and it looks amazing, check it out. This definitely looks like something straight out of a Kerbal Space Program video. SpaceX unfortunately didn't share the entire re-entry, but here's a video of a Falcon 9 fairing during re-entry during last year's Viasat 3 mission, which was the hottest and fastest fairing re-entry ever attempted by SpaceX. While very cool, or hot, <laughs> I will forever miss the days when SpaceX used to catch these things using a giant net. These days they just fish the fairings out of the sea, but that will just never be as cool as the nets in my opinion. And my opinion is correct, of course. <laughs> Last Wednesday saw another Starlink launch, which saw a Falcon 9 carry 23 Starlink satellites to Shell 6 from Cape Canaveral Pad 40. After stage separation, the first stage booster made its 18th overall landing on the assured fall of Gravitas drone ship, wrapping up this year's 100th successful Falcon flight. An insane number. To put that into perspective, that's more launches than every other non-Falcon launch from 2024 combined. There were two other Falcon 9 launches last week, on the 24th and 26th of October, the former being from Vandenberg and carrying the fourth of six dedicated launches of 21 Star Shield satellites, a version of Starlink developed by SpaceX and Northrop Grumman for the US National Reconnaissance Office, and the latter being another Starlink mission from Cape Canaveral Pad 40, carrying 22 two Starlink satellites to Shell 10. NASA astronauts Matt Dominic, Mike Barrett and Jeanette Epps and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin returned to Earth after a seven-month stay aboard the International Space Station, completing the SpaceX Crew-8 mission. This was the eighth crewed operational NASA commercial crew flight, since Starliner hasn't entered service yet, and was the 13th overall crewed orbital flight of Crew Dragon, and, unintentionally, was the longest ever Dragon mission. This was due to a couple of reasons. The mission was originally planned to last the standard 180 days, but it needed to be extended due to the Starliner crew flight test mission experiencing several problems, which resulted in NASA not being sure if its crew would be able to safely return to Earth aboard it, and so the Crew-8 Dragon was kept docked to the station to serve as a lifeboat for the Starliner crew. Of course, the capsule only had four seats, and so two additional makeshift seats were added using foam, straps, and other station soft goods like cushions. These were thankfully never required, and Crew 9's Dragon arrived at the station with just two crew members on board, with the two empty seats reserved for the Starliner crew, after Starliner was ultimately deemed too unsafe and departed autonomously. Crew 8 was then further delayed due to poor weather off the coast of Florida, caused by several storms including the Category 5 Hurricane Milton. These cumulative delays resulted in Crew 8's 180-day mission last a total of 235 days instead, making it comfortably the longest ever Dragon mission. It completed its parachute-assisted splashdown off the coast of Florida last Friday, and while there were no incidents, one astronaut, who wasn't named by NASA, had to be hospitalized due to an undisclosed medical issue, though it was released the following day and said to be in good health. But yeah, as mentioned, a big contributing reason for Crew-8's extended mission time was the problems encountered during Boeing's crewed Starliner mission. With Calypso now safely back on Earth, it unfortunately doesn't seem like Boeing's problems are over. For starters, Intel Sat reported the total loss of their Boeing-built IS-33E communication satellite, which broke up in orbit, causing disruption for Intelsat's customers in Europe, Africa, and parts of the Asia-Pacific region. I wasn't too sure what to put on screen for this bit, so what you're seeing now is the launch of the satellite. Intelsat have stated that they are working with Boeing and government agencies to analyze data and observations, while Boeing declined to directly comment on the incident. The US Space Force stated that they're currently tracking around 20 associated pieces of the satellite. Back on the ground, Boeing has been dealing with a strike of more than 30,000 workers in its commercial aeroplane manufacturing operation over pay disputes, and they've recently agreed to plead guilty to a criminal fraud conspiracy charge and to pay at least $243.6 million after breaching a 2021 deferred prosecution deal in relation to two nearly identical fatal 737 MAX aircraft crashes which resulted in the deaths of 346 people. 
Boeing's issues don't end there. A filing with the US Securities and Exchange Commission last Wednesday contained the disclosure that Boeing is taking another loss of $250 million in its Starliner commercial crew program, on top of a $125 million loss recorded in quarter two, bringing Boeing's total losses on Starliner to around $1.85 billion which is insane and is so high that it's starting to look unlikely that Boeing could actually ever stand to turn a profit on Starliner. Speculation time now, but I doubt we're going to see it enter service until at least 2026, which gives them four years before the ISS gets deorbited, so they'll fly like four to five times in total, assuming Crew Dragon flies every other crew mission. And there are only six Atlas Vs remaining, and Congress has banned building more, so after five operational Starliner missions, assuming the next next Starliner flight is a success, Boeing will need to adapt the spacecraft to launch on a different rocket if they want to continue flying it. Some small reassurance for any American taxpayers who might be watching, Starliner was a fixed cost contract, so while the taxpayer footed a significant portion of the bill, future losses aren't being charged to NASA or the government, they're coming directly from Boeing's pockets. Speaking of costs to the American taxpayer, SLS news! NASA has shared some new footage from earlier this month of Artemis 3's SLS's core stage's liquid oxygen tank being moved to a cleaning cell inside the vertical assembly building at the Mishu facility in New Orleans. Here it'll undergo internal cleaning before being moved to the next phase of production. After this cleaning is completed, teams will need to use mobile clean rooms for future internal access to prevent new external contaminants from entering the tank. We saw two Long March missions from China last week. Tuesday saw the liftoff of a Long March 6 from the Taiwan Launch Center, carrying three Tianping-3 radar calibration satellites to low Earth orbit, which official sources have stated will mainly be used for ground radar equipment calibration and RCS measurement, provide support for ground optical equipment and orbit prediction model corrections. The other Chinese launch was on Wednesday. This was a Long March 2C, which carried three Yaogan 43 spy satellites to low Earth orbit. Official sources have stated that the satellites, which are largely understood to be for reconnaissance, will be mainly used for carrying out tests on new technologies of low orbit constellations. China is also preparing to launch its next crew mission to its space station. The Shenzhou-19 rocket was transported to the launch pad last week, which will carry the eighth crew of three Taikonauts to China's station. Meanwhile, the Shenzhou-18 mission is wrapping up as the crew prepare to depart the station to make way for the crew of Shenzhou-19. Also launching last week was Blue Origin. They successfully completed their New Shepard 27 mission, which was a big one. This was the certification flight of both a brand new New Shepard booster and a brand new human crew capsule. This was the certification flight, so instead of crew members, the rocket carried 12 scientific payloads to an apogee of 101 kilometers and back. Five of these were Blue Origin projects, which CEO Dave Limp tweeted were associated with Blue Origin's lunar program and technologies for future New Shepard and New Glenn missions. Lown Aerospace was back in action last week as well, in a mission to showcase Lynx's amazing new early access release of Parallax Continued. In order to see the best of what the mod does, I visited three different celestial locations, the icy flats of Minmus, the frozen vistas of Val, and the mountainsides of Bop. It really was an interstellar epic, so check it out on screen if you've not already. Massive thank you to the list of names on the right there as well, they're my Patreon and YouTube supporters, and really do make all of this possible. So so huge, huge thank you if your name is in lights there. But that's it for today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed the flight, and I'll see you in the next one.